they're now being told, right, new coach, let's do it completely differently. How can you expect to win anything with a bunch of England rejects? Hello and welcome back to Much Do About Rugby, where we chat about everything rugby. Today we have another guest on for our Rugby Around the World episode series. But before I introduce him, we will have to go through our socials first. We are, of course, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and YouTube for all our recent episodes. And you can find our socials on Instagram and Facebook. The tag is at Much Do About Rugby. Uh, our guest today is from Wales, a place called Barry in Cardiff. And uh, I'm going to just let him take a few minutes to introduce himself now. His name is Joe. So, Joe, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm Joe. I'm born and raised in Wales, so a Boom. wonderful place to be when you're playing rugby. Um, sort of grew up playing. Uh, sort of started playing when I was like 10 in school. Um, sort of went through... High school, got into the regional setup for Cardiff Blues. Um, and then eventually went off to uh, uni in Canterbury and um, played there for the second and first team. Came back home because I realised that uni wasn't all about drinking and rugby. Um, so came back from uni, carried on playing at club level and sort of that's where I'm at now. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. Sounds like you've got had a, a few really good experiences, though. Uh, what position did you play when, when you were playing? I think the only position I haven't played is hooker. So you played prop and <laughs> once upon a time and before back. before you ever pushed in a scrum, the guys <laughs> decided this kid's just started at ten years old. He has no idea what he's doing. Put him in the front row so he doesn't have to run into any back lines. And just hope he hits people hard. So, um, so, what position did you play most recently, though? So, recently, I'm sort of full back centre more than anything. Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, when I was at uni, I played a lot of wing and a lot of centre there. Um, and I was playing for Canterbury Christchurch, um, playing for their, for, their firsts. Um, I played on the wing for them quite a bit. Uh, when I was playing for Cardiff Blues up to like under 16s level, um, I was playing on the wing for them. But sort of through most of my younger rugby life, it was all about the forwards. I was playing on the flank and just getting told if you see a number 10, murder him. <laughs> I understand the transition from forward to a wing. I, I was once the second row myself and um, then moved to flanker and now I'm sitting on the wing, enjoying, enjoying yeah. life out there. It's wonderful until it starts raining. And then <laughs> it's just not nice. <laughs> Gets a bit cold. Yeah, so um, it's actually quite coincidental that you're at Kent because that's actually a lot closer to us, obviously. Uh, there's actually a few links that we have between each other. Mal was obviously at uni in Cardiff, so that's quite close by to you. And yeah. we obviously live, well, I live on the border of Kent and East Sussex, so that's quite close to Canterbury. My brother used to go to school in Canterbury. Um, but there is also another link that um, connects us. And that is that of uh, Rory McConaughey, or should I say Callum McConaughey? There is brother. indeed. Should you, yeah. uh, do you want to explain about that? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, you know, when I got in touch with the pod about coming on and having a bit of an episode with you guys, I sort of went, right, let's go and listen to like every episode they've done. Because <laughs> I'd listened to clips and I was like, I'm just going to go through and like binge listen to everything. And so I sort of like started scrolling through the pod and then I just saw one that was like Rory McConaughey. And I was like, nah. And sort of introduced, and they were like, yeah, yeah. So we went to the same school as Rory. And I was like, no way. Because I went to uni in Canterbury Christchurch, which happened to be the same university as Callum McConaughey. And he played number 10 for our first team. So he was hugely influential for me getting into rugby up there because he was probably the best 10 I've played with. Really? And absolutely, like it definitely runs in the family with those boys. He, yeah, uh, he is very, very talented, and the boot on him was immense. <laughs> Quite a nice person to have in your team, I'm guessing. I mean, we played a bit with Rory, like just trained with him. Like the difference between amateur and professional is just horrendous. Like, oh, it's astounding. You know, I um, mean. 
guys go up to uni and they sort of like, yeah, this is probably the highest level, you know, most players get to because uni rugby is all about fast flowing rugby because you've got a bunch of guys in their early 20s who can, you know, still run and all the beer hasn't <laughs> hit them yet. But yeah, you know, for a lot of guys, that's where their sort of highest player level hits. But you could just, you could just tell that, you know, Callum had such a knowledge of the game and really, really wanted to just absolutely excel in every area of it. Fantastic. Yeah. What a, what a great um, little connection there. Um, I guess now we should probably move into the key topic of this episode, which is obviously Wales and the differences between Welsh and English rugby. Um, so to begin with, I guess we should start by hinting that Wales are particularly bad and poor now yeah. and that <laughs> in 2019 they were on top of the world and you know were for a matter of days uh the top the number one ranked team in the world so what do you think has happened to Wales to begin with why are they so what, what's the difference now I think I think the main point I've sort of fallen back on whenever I've sort of thought about this is that you know, we had 12 years with one coach. You know, you look at the average sort of lifetime of an international coach and it doesn't go beyond four or five years most of the time. Um, Wales had 12 years where one coach came in, flooded a load of new players. I mean, you look at the start of Warren Gatlin's career and it's like George North is coming into the team. Jonathan Davis is coming into the team. Um, Lee Halfpenny starting to make his way into the team. You know, you look at these players and you're like, right, okay, these guys are starting their career at the same time as Warren Gatland is starting with Wales. But you also so, had those like already blooded players like the Warburtons and uh, Anna Wynne Jones, uh, Shane Williams, Hook, you know, all these players that were already like fully fledged internationals. So to be able to blood those young players with the more experienced players makes it so much easier, oh, doesn't it? Oh, hugely, exactly. I mean, you know, you look at, like, the experience they already had in, um, in what, 2008, I think it was, when he came in. Because we just had an absolutely horrendous World Cup in 2007, <laughs> um, where I'm pretty sure we didn't actually make it out of the pool stage. I can't remember, honestly. But, um, yeah, then 2008, Warren Gatlin came in and suddenly we won a Grand Slam. So um, that was, That's you know, painful. That was painful as an England fan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But really, really fun for me. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, what you had is this, you know, this coach who came in, blooded new players, and really, really focused on revitalizing Welsh rugby and playing with his own style. Yeah, but actually using the players that he had to work that style into his game. Um, what we've got now is you've got these players who've been playing in one style for 12 years, you know, for the majority of their career in a lot of cases. And they're now being told, right, new coach, let's do it completely differently. And all right, at an international standard, you'd expect people to be able to change their game. But, you know, when you've had a coach I'm sure like you guys have done the same when you were going through school and all that sort of thing when you've had one coach your entire life and then you go off to another setup the sort of shock to the system of oh yeah this is how we're playing it can get to you but I still don't think that's really an excuse and I think the guys I, should I really think be picking it up I think they've had the whole of 2020 to work out like the new system and try and make it work um and, you know, to win, what, one out of the last seven or eight games? Yeah, seven, I think is, it is. is seven, yeah. It, it, it's not really where Welsh, Welsh rugby should be at, especially after that fantastic year of 2019 they had. Um, where was I going with this? I just think that it's maybe because of the, the you know, amount of injuries as well, possibly. You know, uh, Gareth Anscombe, Ross Moriarty, all of these, like, Where's, where's Navidi in the setup? You've got all these players. Uh, Jonathan Davis has been injured. So I sound like David Brent. Um, <laughs> he's like all these great 
players that that were being blooded by Gatlin like just recently and and like properly coming through and you know Moriarty's had Lions experience Navidi's been like in in well was recently in looking for a Lions call up everyone was had him pegged for a Lions shirt at one point or another so I just think missing those key players and just relying on the experience of maybe one or two others just at like Alan Wynn Jones basically doesn't yeah, really that's, cut that's it. the issue I mean you know everyone always sort of falls back on how much of a leader Alan Wynn Jones is and you do see it on the pitch because whenever someone starts getting a bit irate and you know if a penalty goes against them you know whenever it sort of the camera zooms in on the guy who's the pe- who the penalty's just been conceded by somehow no matter if it's a winger or a prop or a center Alan Wynn Jones is stood next to him like it's fine mate <laughs> I'd like no. you know I think that is pretty impressive but you can't do that with one player on the pitch having this leader that's one player on the pitch and then say, yeah, it's fine. The entire team's going to work. When you've got the likes of Ross Moriarty, Tipperick, who had a game out, Gareth Anscombe, Liam Williams, who's been out during the Autumn Nations Cup, you've still got, you're still missing the VD, like you say. And like, these are the guys that ideally you'd want in partnerships with new players coming through. So rather than having um, James Botham, who came in, at like 19 years old, halfway through the Nations Cup. Who? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so he came through halfway through the Amazon Prime Autumn Nations thing. Um, <laughs> Watching Squid Rugby. And, oh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> who, who does it these days? Yeah. Um, and he, uh, he came in for a game, looked like he had a decent game. The issue was it was against Georgia. <laughs> so I don't think that's the way to blood players against international oppositions. I think, you know, I think if Wayne Pivak is going to commit to blood in new players, he needs to do these sort of selection choices against teams like France, against teams like Scotland, actually commit to getting a proper battering by these teams, really. Because if these players don't learn to lose well at an international level, then... We've, we've got no chance because what seems to be happening is a team gets a couple of points back us, we roll over, and then that's the game over. Well, that's another point I was going to make, actually. You roll over. Now, under the defensive coaching of Sean Edwards, oh, here we go. you guys would not have rolled over at all. In fact, you probably would have, um, you know, given every, every opposition a much, much harder, harder match than, than you did especially this year. Um, yeah. But, you know, can you really blame the whole collapse of a defensive system on, on one player, like, or on one coach leaving? Can you really do that? Like, these players are still international class players and they should still be able to tackle. They should, yeah. If you want to ask Welsh Rugby Facebook, then it's absolutely down to one coach and it's only Sean Edwards that ever mattered and that's all we should have ever kept. But, these are international players and if they're not able to perform at this level and continue from a year like where like you say for a matter of days we were number one in the world we won a six nations title we got through to the quarterfinals at uh, the semi-finals of a world cup how are we how are we fallen so far to be beaten by scotland and you know battered by france well scotland are coming up i think scotland are good <laughs> they are they're, they're moving really really well i think Everyone needs to stop talking about Stuart Hogg like he's the only good player on their team, to be honest. But, yeah, they're, they're looking really, really good. Yeah, Mal, what were you going to say? Um, I was just... With uh, Wales, do you think uh, it, their team, because they, their coaching setup was so good, do you think maybe, the especially the 2019 year, that obviously, I don't know, what's your, what, from a Welsh point of view, do you think the, the uh, actual players do you think they're world class players or do you think it's just a bunch of like decent decent like decently good players all put together but because of the coaching made it an outstanding team um, I think when you look more at say a team like Japan that's where you get that whole thing of a coach like Eddie Jones when he went into Japanese rugby sort of bound this team together um 
and that's where that whole thing of you know a load of decent international players suddenly become world class because of the coach around them but you look at like the, the likes of Josh Adams who I know has a quiet autumn and um, you look at Navidi you look at Moriarty I think these guys are world class players <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, all he's going to say is it's OJ, but if him and Courtney Laws actually learn where an offside line is, then England might be in trouble. It's OJ literally carried England in the Northern <laughs> Nations Cup, so yeah, let's not talk about England. got to against Wales. <laughs> <laughs> Still got to in there. No, we'll, we'll, we'll just forget that, that England just, you know, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come on to England in a minute, I think. Uh, <laughs> we, we've got a lot to talk about in that sense. <laughs> But um, I'd like to first comment more on Wales, to be honest, because actually, when you look, England's actually quite a uh, good point here, because when you look at the Wales lineup or the Wales squad, 90% of their players are English. 30%. Okay, <laughs> 30%. It's still quite a Let's high percentage. Let's not go 90% okay. now, because we've got so, at least five Australians. I'm, I'm, ex- I'm exaggerating. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. But, but the, the, my point is here, that how can you expect to win anything when you're picking players who who are England rejects and obviously aren't good enough to get into an England quality international side? Because I'm not I'm not going to be around the bush. England are just a better team than Wales. Oh, they are at the minute. Yeah, always Absolutely. always have always have been. Yeah, except um, when we beat you thirty three. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, there are a couple of fluky results here and there. But um, yeah, how was the no, twenty fifteen World Cup? Or <laughs> yeah, not not great, not great. But um, <laughs> we'll skip that. Uh, um, but my point is, is that you know you've got who, who was it? Mal Johnny Williams was it? Who's starting yeah, at yeah. starting at centers play, playing for England? Well, you had Johnny Williams and Nick Tompkins in the center, who yeah. exactly. are both English. And they um, played the, like Johnny Williams has played. As well. He's played for England against yeah, the Barbarians. He's against the Barbars, which is like, bizarre. I just really didn't understand it. So my question is, how can you expect to win anything with a bunch of England England rejects? He did score against you. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I think <laughs> there's um there there is a lot to be said for that, but I think. Wales has a real problem with their regional setup at the minute. Um, you know, we've got four teams in Wales. So we've got the Blues, Dragons, Scarlets and the Ospreys. Um, all of those are South Wales based. There's one North Wales region that just takes up all of the northern <laughs> half of Wales. Um, and to be honest, it's the northern three quarters of Wales. It's not even the northern half. Um, and that just leads to so many players who either have been born and raised in Wales or maybe are Welsh by blood or whatever else, have relatives who are Welsh who'd want to play in Wales, going elsewhere because there just isn't the money in the regional setup to pay world-class players world-class wages. So, I mean, you look at um, George North when he went off to Northampton. He's now moved back to Wales. Um, You know, so, so, so many Welsh players move to England anyway. I think there's always going to be a crossover between Welsh and English players. Um, in fact, the Ben Morgan, number eight for England for a, f- a few years ago, he was Welsh, born and raised, Welsh, and then went yeah. over to play for England. So yeah, but why there is always going to be enough? a crossover. But, you know, I think there is a bit to be said about actually how much Wales needs more uh, homegrown professional setup yeah homegrown talent yeah and I think from from your point of view like you obviously were part of the Cardiff Blues Academy for a while uh, which is seriously impressive and I, how many kind of players would you say would come over from the other side of the border from England to, to play would, would it be many or would it just be you know Welsh Welsh people basically through and through yeah so I mean, at the level I played, so I was under 16. So, you know, you're Mm -hmm. still a few years off of getting professional contracts at that point anyway, Mm -hmm. unless you're Louis Zamet, who seems to just get (laughs) whatever age he wants. Um, Or, you know, Shane Williams, you know, unless you're, I know, unbelievable and sickening and makes me feel really old. Um, (laughs) 
unless you're you know you're up at that level where you can compete at international level i'm not saying he's a world beater but i think you know he's clearly able to compete at that level so unless you're there you're not going to be jumping around all over the place at that regional setup you know you're going through your local club um weirdly doesn't go through schools at that age goes all through club rugby Mm -hmm. um and you sort of you know you have your scouts going out uh to games through the season they'll then send messages to the club saying we want to look at these players can you let us know who they are can you get us in touch with some of the players you think are um rising to the top in your team which is great because it leads to all the coaches putting their sons in for trials no matter how fat they are yeah um and then from there you go on to your trials you know you have essentially two months over the summer where you're essentially just doing fitness tests every session you're doing skills based tests every session you're starting to put together some back lines and like working out some moves you're then expected to work as a back line to create your own moves and then you're basically doing a touch game you know at the end of each session yeah. playing against another back line that have been coming up with their own moves and it's brilliant because you have a really high try score in game at the end of a session because everyone talks about their attacking moves and no one talks about how they're going to defend. But the way that that works then is obviously you're going through your under 16s level, you get your guys who sort of rise to the top of that and start competing properly. Then from there, you move up to your under 18s level where they sort of shrink the squad down again, start moving up again and again. And that's sort of how they look at getting players into this uh, sort of system at the moment i guess but each sort of region has their own academy anyway that they sort of base out of comprehensive schools so i mean even though there is a focus on rugby at those schools they're still you know they're still comprehensive they still haven't got the funding of private schools to you know go mm. oh yeah we're gonna get a you know brand new two million pound uh gym yeah just because we can so um yeah there's a lot there's a lot to be said for the way the welsh setup actually does bring players through but i think there's still a lot of work to be done and with four regions that are playing professional rugby you've got a player base of probably about 120 players across those four regions yeah. Pro you know probably more like 200 yeah but and you've got to rely on like six of them coming through per year that are going to be like of good World enough class. quality to to, yeah. to make it into that international side probably or Whereas, to have a chance what, how many clubs are in england now yeah <laughs> there's a good there's, silly. What, how many are in the prem i mean there's like there's, there's 12 in the prem in the, 12 there's in the 12 prem. in the prem but um yeah you've got the well even that's three times got the as many players as well underneath that you've got championship yeah. underneath that as well so people go through like ealing trail blazers or trail finders or whatever they're called or like, even like semi-professional clubs like the, the Clapham Falcons or whatever, Archie Curzon, like they'll yeah. they'll be like of a decent enough standard that they'll be able to compete. So, and I just think it's the difference between you know you say about the comprehensive schools in England. Obviously, it's all about private schools. Rugby is private yeah. school sport, and if you play rugby, then it's likely that you either went to boarding school or like just a school that was basically up itself which yeah know. it was really weird going to uni and seeing that i was the only welsh guy on the team at uni yeah and uh um, it was really really weird sort of chatting to guys about school life and i was saying oh yeah you know i'd walk to school every board and they'd be like why i stayed at school <laughs> so, yeah what's going yeah, on it's it's different different uh you know I, I guess, but was was uh, was it like compulsory to play rugby at, at a comprehensive school, or was it? No, kind of not not compulsory. I mean, you know, you do a bit in PE lessons. Yeah. But um, it, it was never a huge thing because obviously, you know, when you're in PE, it's like right, okay, this week we're doing football, next week we're doing rugby. Yeah. Week after that, we're doing basketball because it's raining and we can't go on the field. You know, it was all of this sort and of thing. It, was it kind and of like you had to? Summer, drag yourself down to the club in order to actually play yeah. oh yeah you go to you go to clubs you know yeah schools had teams but i mean my school he, so we played with our age group every year mm. so um year seven we were like under 12s 
year eight under 13s but we played within our year group we didn't cross over until we hit like year 11 and then a few of our boys uh in my year had got into the blues um set up so the minute we turned 16 our teachers were like right do you want to step up and play with the sixth form boys you know have a couple of games with them see how you go and we're like yeah fine we'll get involved um but that's the only real crossover you get is between yeah. year 11 and year 13 um that's where the crossover comes but until that point it's very much you play in your year groups and outside of that the boys who play for school probably all play for the same club with a few extras yeah. from another school um but clubs where you get your training you know most clubs will do one or two training sessions a week and they'll be having games every Sunday morning or Saturday afternoon as you get older. Mm -hmm. And then, but in school, you know, there's, there's no training because half the teachers don't care anyway. They, yeah. You know, they're happy to have your boys do all your fitness outside of school, do all your training outside of school, rock up. You probably all play for the same club anyway. So, you know, your moves and you just run those. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting to me because obviously you see it, in England, we we spoke about it on previous episodes. You know, you just get given a scholarship to a ridiculously yeah. nice school like Harrow. You know, that's where the Bunapolas went, and that's where Toje went, stuff like that. So, and you know, uh, Maka Bunapola has got a Welsh accent for crying down the sink. Like he's he's, he's yeah. well, he wasn't born in Wales, but they they moved he to Wales. Moved and then over he got there. Given I mean, her. I think he's uh, Tulupe Falatau's cousin. Exactly. So. so um, you know, I mean, talk about taking Welsh players, mate. Let's have a but it's, back. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's these, uh, you know, these movements that the English schooling system can afford because it's so compulsory to play uh, like any private school, basically. You know, if, if at prep school, you'll play a term of rugby at least. And if you don't want to play rugby, then, you know, no one minds. No one cares, but <laughs> but it's, it's like if you're sporty you will play rugby and you will play cricket and you will play football so you'll be uh, you know open to all sports and and exposed to all of them and then when you move into senior school all the big private schools play rugby and they take it seriously yeah and i think that's probably where the differences lie because they take it so seriously they can afford to just i don't know look you know look at someone like a Mako Vinopola or a Billy V and just go like, oh yeah, he's good at rugby. We'll take him because yeah. he's going to make we'll us our sport because he'll going to make our sport look of the good. league and exactly we'll look good and we'll probably get a little bonus for winning the league. Yeah, I mean, exactly. We do have a similar um, couple of schools in Wales. We've got uh, Llandovery College and um, College of Gar, which is in Carmarthen, mm. um, West Wales. So we have colleges like that that are private schools that are rugby schools and feed a lot of people into academies so uh george north went to llandovery college yeah um and came through that setup so there are schools like that in wales but they're not as uh prominent prevalent as ones. yeah and there aren't there aren't as many of them um you know again looking at the regional sides you know there are only four in wales we've got a pool of maybe maybe 200 players whereas you've got 12 uh, premier 12 premiership sides another load of championship sides and if i talk about just quickly wales's semi-pro leagues it is nothing compared to the english semi-pro yeah seriously interesting to get a really good insight into the nuances of welsh rugby and where they stand at the moment and uh possibly what differences there are with with english and welsh rugby between the two um so thank you very much for chatting about that joe um but moving on to a topic you actually requested to talk about today on the pod which of course, is quite prevalent today in, in the rugby world because obviously it's something that a lot of pundits have been chatty about. What, why don't you explain what it is? Um, yeah, so this sort of uh, came about because I started seeing it pop up on Twitter more and more with um, some seasoned pundits, shall I say. Uh, you know, don't want to say old, but they uh, seem to be popping up more and more with the classic sort of attitude of, oh, the game's gone soft, there's too much kicking, the game's boring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, I think I spent about two hours one night just replying to random pundits who I'd never <laughs> actually heard of, just going, you're wrong, 
but because uh, I've been loving the Automations Cup and I've actually really, really enjoyed it. But I've just been, I could not believe that people could just have so many monumentally bad takes on the modern game. Um, so I've definitely thrown around my weight way too much for someone who has never played professional rugby. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I was just, it wasn't great to hear these guys who haven't played in 30 years slating players who are playing now. And I think that, yeah, that's why I wanted to talk about it. What was the actual, what was the actual reason why they were saying the game is boring? Is it like the whole kicking element? Is it that, is that yeah. what it is? I, yeah, just, it's, that's a huge part of it. They're saying there's way too much kicking in the game. It's all about just a game of ping pong. <laughs> which I, I like, just found hilarious like that, because I'm not being funny. I can't run for 80 minutes straight. I don't know if they can. <laughs> it, it so, makes, um, it's good. Ta- it's like tactical. It makes it more tactical. It's like, it's a bit like, it's kind of like, I guess you could kind of say like chess. Like, so like that, like just because it's like more tactics involved, like obviously it's good when you see a flair player like sprinting through, breaking the line, but not like, you're not going to be, not every player is going to be able to do that. Like if you're sprinting, yeah. Like as a, we're all back here. Like when you're going, like getting the ball, sprinting full pace, and then having to stop. Like it's it, scary. It, yeah, what <laughs> it's, it's, it's knackering. Like for forwards, it's more of like a plodding along, but like sprinting, stopping, sprinting. Well, yeah, you know, forwards. I mean, it's hit a ruck, then spend two phases working back round, then get the ball, then charge it forward. If they play, it, you know, if rugby was being played like they wanted it to be played, then all it would be is. Pass it to the winger, see if he can do something. Oh no, he's got tackled. Okay, pass it to the other winger, see yeah. if he can do something. That and then all you'd work. end up is George North getting that, knocked out every week, and the game is that not what that. New Zealand basically have done for the last, you know, ever since rugby was created? Because I'm like, I don't know, New Zealand have this very attractive style of rugby, but do you think that's just inbuilt in their system? And for us Northern Hemisphere folk who are a bit, um, you know, maybe maybe a tiny bit bigger, and um, you know, because South Africa do it as well. They just trundle up. We heard it with, with yeah. John uh, a couple of weeks ago. They just like to, you know, trundle up and use their use their weight. So if we have the the power in our in our pack, why would we not trundle up and then try and kick so that the quick guys might be able to get the ball back? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, sort of watching the Autumn Nations Cup. You, I don't know if you guys caught it, but Sam Warburton actually explained the kicking game at one point um and i think he put it really really succinctly because he just said look if you kick the ball 40 meters the other team catches it runs 20 meters with it and you tackle them you've and then maybe win the ball back you've gained 20 meters if you go through eight phases and get knocked back on three of them you might make two yeah it's like so yeah if and with a lot phase, more effort you can make yeah if in one phase you can make 20 meters you're going to take that every time. Um, I do think there's something to be said about the Caterpillar Ruck and closing that down. Oh, I hate that. Mm. I hate that. It really annoys me. I'll, t- I'll tell you what, um, the, the refereeing, we'll come on to the Champions Cup possibly at the end of the episode, but um, Luke Pierce last night was refereeing, I think it was La Rochelle versus Edinburgh. Okay. And he was actually really hot on getting them to use it and wanting them to play quick, quick rugby, which is obviously what's helping the game at the moment. Because when you see X to play or someone of that vein or, you know, a, basically a very good team, they're always quite slow around yeah. the rocks and just getting forward Caterpillar and then taking as much time as it takes to, to kick the ball. Whereas Luke Pierce was refereeing the game so well and telling them to use it basically from the moment the ball was available and ready and yeah. then, like, constantly telling them to use it. I think that it's something that referees really need to consider doing because they actually have – they can dictate the pace of the game. They can yeah. tell players to use it. So I don't think it's all players' fault, and I don't think it's all coaches' fault. I think it's referees as well have a responsibility for, for making the game a little bit more exciting. Now, I'm not saying I'm not excited by the rugby currently. I, You know, especially – you know, a couple of the games were seriously good good to watch yeah. despite some of the kicking battles and stuff. But I just think, you know, referees, especially in international rugby, could make it more exciting. Yeah, and I think everyone on the pitch at international rugby, including the referees, including the coaching teams, have a responsibility to keep the game flowing. And I mean, you know, we, we sort of talk about 
how the the kicking game slows the game down and this sort of thing. But actually, like you say with Luke Pierce, if you're on top of players and making sure that they're kicking it quickly if they're going to kick, then it's going to work really well. And I mean, Wales last year, they didn't slow down once. You know, they tried to drive everything out quickly, used Gareth Anscombe as their main kicking threat. And that way you actually had the ball a bit further out of the ruck, but it was out much quicker and it was kicked much quicker. So looking at this box kick at the minute, I mean, you get rid of the Caterpillar ruck, it almost solves the problem in itself because Mm -hmm. your scrum halves, they can't wait for 20 seconds to actually kick the ball out because the likes of Mara Toje will be set by then. Well, I think, uh, you know, I think there is actually a point to be made for in in favour of England here, where actually Ben Youngs is oh, one of the fastest... really quick with the box kick. He's fastest been brilliant. Box I've kick. actually enjoyed watching England for the first time in my life. Exactly. So I think, you know, take a page out of Ben Youngs' book and because bef- if you do it quickly before the defence is set, before the likes of, you know, Alan Wynne-Jones who are going to be hunting for the charge down, if you do it that quickly, then actually it gives everyone on your team because you're already set you already know you're exiting yeah. you've made the call so just do it quickly and then their winger might not be set you might you know catch someone out of position you know your guys are already hunting the hunting the ball after the kick's been made they have to turn they're not yeah. expecting it there's so many more possibilities if you do it quickly and speed up the game and exactly. it's all about organized defenses and if you can get organized quickly then you're fine but if you reduce the possibility of them being organized you're going to force an error yeah absolutely and i mean all teams are looking at at the minute is with their exit is get themselves set whereas actually what's the point in getting yourself set if the defense is ready to take you on every single time Hmm. and i mean it's the same thing with pod play at the minute where you see the likes of ireland and wales taking an absolute age to get the ball out to their pods and you're going, oh. okay, well, England have got 14 men in their line now. Yeah, you're not but England's forward. defense is unmatched. England's like, defense was absolutely unreal through this tournament. And, and the same with France. I mean, they were really, really ahead of the rest in their defense. Um, and I think England's back three just proved why they're there. Because well, I just think that's actually one of the. We talk about kicking being a boring part of the game, but there are some seriously exciting kicks that did happen during the course of the tournament. I mean, the one place England looked weak uh, was the chip over the top, the chip and chase, you know, little kick over the top. So I just think, you know, if and if someone does a grubber kick, you know, and it goes out on the five-meter line and puts pressure on the opposition, is that boring or is that exciting? Because you're putting the the opposition under pressure. If I had Josh Adams and Johnny May chasing each other down to the five meter line after someone's put a grubber kick through, I am on my feet. Like I am losing it. I'm gone. <laughs> but you know, like people always say that kicking makes the game boring, and I just I could not disagree more because what's actually making it boring is this caterpillar ruck and taking twenty seconds to set for a kick, which shouldn't happen anyway, because the laws say that you should have five seconds to use it once it's at the back of the ruck. But refs seem to like scrum halves for some reason yeah <clears throat> also i think scrummaging there's a there's a you know i think they need to put an emphasis on speeding up the scrums because that's another area of the game where it's just becoming too slow and the resets i think scrums you can't keep the ball you shouldn't be able to keep the ball in the scrum in order to win the penalty mm-hmm. i think it should be more like the balls at the back at the eight feet you use it now yeah, because, you have three seconds to use, you know, you... Exactly. You I think it's the refs, as soon as it's at the number eight's feet, they call to use it. If the nine doesn't within a couple of seconds, it's a free kick to the opposition. And I mean, Mal, you I always take say... take scrums out as an option of a free kick because it's, I'm sick of it. Mal, you always say, um, you know, we want to see the backs play. Yeah, That's I mean, as, as backs. 100%. I think... What's cool? Just I think to be honest, I think we'll probably see a move towards the fast game. We've already seen with the the rucks the whole thing of you have to get in there so quick, otherwise it's going to be a turnover. Like any upward movement on the ball, upward pulling on the ball is a turnover. So if you're not 
essentially getting there quickly and covering the ball, then you're going to lose it straight away. So that they are trying to move. I think they are trying to move towards a faster game. So with all, I think with kicking, like as as Ed said, I think if you're able to kick it all the way down into their territory, like like you see in England, like last year, their Farrell was doing loads of kicks where Johnny May would sprint onto it, and like those kind of kicks are entertaining. Like, but I think just all these, like yeah, as you said, box kicks where they're going high, not very far, like kind of hoping someone will stumble on it or someone might or will regain. The, it can be entertaining, but I think, yeah, the Caterpillar rug is definitely something that should be looked at. Um, but at the end of the day, I just want to see the backs get it and play nice running rugby, whether they get it, run it, and then kick it through, like Finn Russell style, or just like run it out to the wing. It's all, that's what I want to see. So, yeah. on that note, how do we create solutions for this? Now, I've thought of just a couple which might like reduce the kicking game you've already mentioned like or just generally how to speed the game up basically or make it a little bit more exciting so my first solution is that in order for everyone to be on side after a kick is made it's the kicker and the kicker only that that can put the players on side what would okay. be the actual effects of that what would you think so it just means that you know, you can't rely on Anthony Watson coming up behind Elliot Daly running at full speed to to come and bring everyone on side. It has to be Elliot Daly. So there's almost that time factor. So it gives the players on the opposition probably more chance to attack. Yeah. So do you think that... Do you would, not think? Do you think that would maybe disincentivize people to kick a bit less? Yeah, ex exactly. So, I, yeah, you know, this is the problem that people have. having. box kick immediately because number nines love a kick and then wait behind the line for 20 minutes. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, there's that aspect of it. But um, are there, is there anything else you guys can think of, like, that would possibly speed up the game, possibly, you know, lead to some more tries being scored, maybe? You know? I think, I think players will play what they can play. Like whether it's like in, in terms of laws, like whatever's going to be most going to get them the win, they're going to play. So I think as we were saying earlier, it's definitely down to the referees being more strict on timings. Like the, like they're strict in other some areas, but then like much more relaxed in others. So if they can be a bit more like well-rounded, perhaps, and I think that's just yeah. something to look at off the pitch, really. Um, and then I mean, yeah, you look at it. like what the the rucks at the minute. Refs call, use it, and then another 10 seconds later, the scrum half eventually yeah, picks it. <laughs> and yet, in the same ruck, you know, if someone gets one hand to the ball after they've made a tackle, as long as they've showed a clear release, it's an immediate penalty. But if they don't quite release enough, it's an immediate penalty the other way. And it's like, I understand what they're trying to do with these rucks in terms of encourage people to compete legally, but you know, draw a line. But it's also, they're so hyper-focused on turnover laws at the minute that they've forgotten that scrum halves like to slow the game down whenever they can because they want to rest. Mm. Yeah. No, yeah. Really so, yeah. Joe, do you watch Super Rugby at all? Not really, to be honest. I just, I don't have time. Yeah, no, <laughs> honestly. It's, because, because we've obviously, our first episodes were more on the, along the Super Rugby lines because we had the Super Rugby... Yeah. Artiroa, to pronounce it correctly. I actually did pronounce it correctly that time. Well done. Um, and um, yeah, so they have like I think hotter turnover laws over there than we do here. So it's literally if you touch the ball, I was getting well annoyed at it because it was almost like slowing the game down more. Where yeah. if you touch the ball, then you give a penalty away, and it's and it was just like so counterintuitive the fact that. You know, you can't even give the opportunity to, to clear out the man trying to get the ball. Um, I, think, I think it should be if you clear them out, then, you, then they're not on the ball properly and, and they're not, you know, really competing for it. They've just touched the ball. You know, everyone touches the ball during the game in, in the ruck, don't they? Well, yeah, so exactly. uh, I think if you just... Uh, 
if, if you actually penalise it too much, it slows the game down and just gives gives way too many way, way too many penalties. And these penalties just lead to more minute long yeah, kicks. Yeah. And these these kicks they take the full minute and more. They take a minute and thirty sometimes because oh, yeah. it's it's when the tee goes on the field or something they start the timer, which is non-existent. Um, I think you know. Well, I think there is a big thing around the whole. There's a big focus on get like getting we're getting wins by penalties at the moment. Like maybe that is kind of contributing to the whole boringness of the game. Because I mean, yeah, I think there was a there was a game I don't know one a few weeks ago where Lee Halfpenny kicked all of the Scarlets' points and they won a game. How, what was the score in that one? Oh, I can't remember. He he kicked something like nine penalties, oh. so I think they had twenty-seven points, all from his boot, all from yeah. penalty kicks. It reminds it's me. Like, of, it reminds me of Quidditch. It's like you know that the the World Cup final in Quidditch and Harry Potter when they scored like loads of points with the quaffle, but then the other team caught the snitch, yeah. and still lost. Yeah, exactly. And it's like you, so you can score like the best try ever or a couple of really nice tries. But because you've given away so many penalties and the other teams kick so many points, it's like 23 15, 23 14 or something. Yeah. And you've lost the game because of a few errors. But if, if you, I think there is a, another point to be made, a solution to that, to that aspect of the game where you could reduce the, now it's quite a big change, reduce the amount of points for a penalty goal or a drop. Actually, maybe not for a drop goal because it's more exciting and open play, more tricky. Yeah. Uh, but for a penalty kick to two points. So it incentivizes you to go for the corner to get that five points for the try and the two extra for the conversion. Possibly you can reduce it to one point for a conversion. Yeah. Um, I mean, either anything... that or you just limit where you're actually allowed to take penalties from. You know, you say it's only allowed in the opposition's half. You're allowed to take a penalty kick for goal. Yeah. Because otherwise you get the half, likes of daily or, you know, I, beyond the opposition's 10 or something like that. You know, I think, make I it think have that would be, be better. I think that would be better because I think, you know, the percentage of kicks that are taken outside the opposition half and unless you have Daly or Francois Stein on your team you're not well, going to take half penny's one. done it James Hook used to do it you know <laughs> I, I mean I don't follow there well, is a me. lot there's a lot of players <laughs> I think in modern rugby now who will take these kicks from the 10 meter line because they're like well if I get it we get three points or we're back in the lead if I don't get it we've still got 10 minutes to go you know in the yeah. end of this game I, we're think, like, I think the only points. thing with uh, the penalty is the the reason why penalties are also good in another way is because they are dis. They are try. If you like, if you're able to get so many points from kicking penalties, you obviously don't want to be giving away penalties, which you could argue leads to maybe like a cleaner game. Which at the end of the day, I think is a big focus. Like we've seen all like the the things about like all these old players getting head, head injuries. I can't I can't remember who it is, but there's someone recently who's come out saying Steve they've got Thompson. like Thompson. Yeah. Like all night and it's um, yeah, Alex Popham as well, who used to play for Wales, has come out and said it. He's been diagnosed with early onset dementia at the age yeah. of 40. Yeah. Both him yeah. and Steve Thompson, and you know, World Cup winner 2003, played hooker. So, so sad and devastating for him and his family. Yeah, and I think, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's horrendous, and it's a horrendous disease. Um, and it's horrible that that's you know what the game's caused to some of these guys, hmm. but I still think you know the game is moving in the right direction with the high tackle laws. I still think yeah. there's more work to be done on that um, in terms of looking at high tackles. I mean, Dan Bigger and Owen Farrell both need to talk into in their tackle technique because both of them just go for your face and hope for the best. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, yeah. there, there are a lot of players out there who are going for that. And I think if you're forcing players to tackle lower, you allow for more offloads, you allow for a quicker, more flowing game. Yeah. yeah. That could be another change like you look at kind of comes full circle when when you like think about it like that which is a very good point yeah um and talking about um you know exciting games of rugby that we might have watched recently there was one game which i did comment on in the previous episode that i might need to apologize for because i did say that you say i completely forgot (laughs) (laughs) i said that england would i i said that I'll quote myself. There's every chance that England could win this game by 60 points. Um, oh, what, what game was that again? Was that England France? Yeah. It was the England France. The France game second the final, team, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> final of the Autumn Nations Cup. Um, and it ended up being, what, 19, 16, 21, 19, or something like that. 
something along those lines. Um, um, but yeah, basically England won yeah. by three points with a last gasp penalty after foul miss four and made it a long, much longer and more drawn out match than it needed to be. Um, Mal, what were your thoughts on the, on the game in general? France are a bloody good team. Um, I, saw, <laughs> I, I saw this uh, fact the other day, which um, I think it was this morning actually, which was France have four international fly halves with caps under the age of 25 now, which I think is um, obviously Untermac, Jaliba, Louis Carbonell, and then one other guy. And so the, it's just like, and then obviously combined with their performance last weekend kind of just shows their depth. And it's pretty scary, to be honest, considering we had like a full strength squad and they had almost none of their players. It's kind of scary that they that they were that good. And we, to be honest, we probably should have lost, but um, I'm happy we came out with a win. Yeah, Joe, what, as a Wales fan, what was your thoughts on the match? So <laughs> I completely forgot that this was on. Uh, <laughs> I was like, it was a Sunday. I'd watched the other three games the day before and got very drunk. So <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I was sort of driving along, had the radio on, and then I was like, "Oh, and then we go over to uh, the France England game." And I was like, "Crap, I'm forgetting it." Oh no! <laughs> um, so like, like got home, got it straight on, and it was the second half, and it was like all level. And I was like, "Hang on a minute, what's what's going on? <laughs> what what's happening?" Yeah, um, I just thought it was an unreal performance from like both sides, really, because I think England probably went in there a little bit complacent in terms of, you know, like you guys were saying, like second string France side. And it's very difficult for players to get away from that media aspect of it nowadays. You know, you can't just go in and isolate yourself from the media because it is everywhere. Um, and obviously all the players are on Twitter and things like that as well. So they're going to be constantly having people in their mentions like, oh, you're going to put 60 points past France. You're going to put 50 points past France. You're going to go and smash France. <laughs> you know, I was assuming you did it, Ed, but... Um... Well, I, I don't have Twitter, so I, I unfortunately could not do that. Um, it's only people that watch the podcast and watch the clip that would have, uh, would have known that I said that, which is probably fortunate during... <laughs> you know. um, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, there is a reason why England wouldn't have done as well as probably everyone expected them to. Uh, I think it's because you can't make any assumptions or you can't tactically build a performance uh, on a team that you basically know nothing about. Yeah. So I think England would have gone into that game confidently saying, we'll just play our way and we'll, we can't predict the way that they're going to play, but we'll just bulldoze them like we did with Ireland and like we did with Wales. So I, I think, think they probably they were completely surprised. expected France to use a second string side against another team. Exactly. So I, I think, think they, they were probably... surprised when, when France came out with a lot of fight and a lot of hunger to beat us. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think, honestly, between Jalibert and, and Tamak, I don't think there's much difference. I think Jalibert's nearly a world-class 10. I think he absolutely dictated that French attack and kicked outstandingly well, put England under so much pressure. Um, that, that led to the try as well. That was mad. Four yeah, was mad. yeah. Slings out wide. Love yeah, he's a, he's a very talented player. And I, we were watching... He plays for Bordeaux, doesn't he? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because we were watching a Champions Cup match the or a Challenge Cup match the other day. Um, I think it was Bordeaux versus Bristol in the yeah. Champion Challenge Cup yeah. final. Yeah, yeah. And Jaddy Bear came off, and Mal, you, we were messaging obviously about it, and Mal was like, "That's a big loss for them. He's been like that by far and away their best place. Dictated every attack. He's dictated the kicking game, and I just think it." It helps so much if you have someone like that to come in, even though your first your first string fly half, even though I'm not sure how close the first and second string is between Tamak and Jaddy Bear. You know, could you play a 10-12 combination or a 10-15 combination between those two? Because they so are good. both so good. I've seen a lot of, seen a lot of like people put him in Jaddy Bear as the as the uh, ten of the Autumn Nations Cup in like their their like team of the tournament. 
So he, he's obviously like, and he only played like half the games as well. So he was actually, he was, yeah, really good. And um, yeah, I think France have a lot going for them at the moment. I'm excited to see how they do like going into the, like I think it's Six Nations the next tournament we have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in like a week. So when does that start? <laughs> It starts on Christmas uh, Day, Mal. Oh, does it? Yeah. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> when did it start? No, it starts. Uh, January, start of I February, I think oh, it is. Right, right. Oh, right. You never know when when the fixture. It's all messed up at the moment, so I wouldn't have been surprised. Christmas if Day. <laughs> I had yeah, know. they're actually just going to do all of the games over Christmas and New Year. Yeah. It's, it's going to be mad. <laughs> to be fair, that would be very exciting. I wouldn't say no. Um, oh, I'd be even more confused than I am normally <laughs> between Christmas and New Year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, like serious kudos to, to France because I don't, you know, when no one expects anything of you, that's often when the uh, big shock results happen. We've seen it happen with Japan and South Africa. We've seen it happen with, who, who was, was it Fiji and Wales won World Cup? And yeah. that was a shock result of that tournament. I think it was 2007. Um, yeah, you know, we've seen it happen so many times before, and this this would have been one of those almost giant killings because of the team that, that France fielded, and because of the odds so heavily stacked in England's favour. But you know, the boys just come out on top. Itoje with the turnover at the end. Yeah, he uh, only, only took him um, fifteen extra minutes, which is a yeah. very French thing to do, I must add. <laughs> just delay. <laughs> just, yeah, we'll have an extra twenty minutes possible. on the end of this game make everything as difficult as possible. I thought Fowl had his worst game in a while, um, but I thought Elliot Daly had one of his better games, to be honest, under the high ball. Um, who else stood out for you, Mal, as someone who who impressed? I think it's just, I don't know. I, the English team just wasn't that impressive in general. Like, as you said, we played our normal play, but it just wasn't as, we didn't execute it like we usually did. Um, so it was just all the French players that really impressed me. Um, that I got, I can't remember all those all those French players that we don't know. Yeah, yeah I, that's yeah. it. I, I was trying to think of one there. French player then. We like, know Jalibert. We playing. That's it. Yeah, we know Jalibert. That's it. Doulin. Um, he, was he the fullback? He was. He's Doulin. Yeah, he's tiny as well. He played. He played quite well. Um, but yeah, so in, England won in the end. Uh, Wales beat Italy, of course. In a, in Again, a, in a, yeah. start 2020 as we, <laughs> as we finish it. Um, um, no, seriously boring match though, that one, to be honest. It wasn't, it wasn't great, but there were some glimpses of how Wales are supposedly trying to play. And I think there's something to be taken from that. Talupe Falatao and Justin Tipperick had their best game yeah. they had in a while. George wild. North as well. George, George North. North looked really, really solid at 13. Um it always seems to be the case with Wales that when we have about five players playing out as a position, we suddenly have one of the best games we've had in a while. Um, I mean, I think we did it against you guys one time against England. and We had, uh, I think, Lloyd Williams out on the wing. Uh, and like, no, Thomas Williams, that was it. He was playing <laughs> on the wing. So we had two scrum halves on the field. And... You know, it always seems to be that when everything goes against Wales and we suddenly have players playing everywhere and not in the right position, we seem to play well. But maybe that's the game plan, and maybe Wayne Pivak should just make maybe all the that's the game the plan. Maybe <laughs> we should just have all the forwards play in the backs, all the backs play in the forwards, <laughs> and we'll beat everyone. We'll be fine. This is the game plan, guys. We're going to completely muck everything up. <laughs> yeah. Um, with switcheroo, the old switcheroo. Yeah, that's the it. old switcheroo, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly. Wales? Where do you see Wales going next year? Then how do you how do you see their year going in twenty twenty one? I think. It's a difficult one. If they solidify their coaching team, because to be honest, we've had two guys leave this year in Sam Warburton and Byron Haywood. Um, you know, we've already started having changes in our coaching team. Whereas when we had Warren Gatland, it was so, so secure and just stable the whole time. I think if we can secure that and actually get some time in training to actually work on the game systems without having someone getting sacked every other week, we might do quite well. But I can never tell with Wales. 
I can I can never tell, and it's why I love supporting Wales because oh, I will go into every game terrified, and if I win, I'm really happy, and if I lose, I'm probably depressed for the next three days. Yeah, tell me about it. Being an England fan, the point is that you expect to win everything, and when you don't, <laughs> it's just even harder. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was a uh, uh, funny anecdote. I was in Canterbury in 2015 for the World Cup. Uh, at uni and I walked proudly into the Jolly Sailor um, and with my Wales shirt on Bad idea. and then Wales beat England with a scrum half on the wing to knock them out yeah. of their own World Cup and I got given an England shirt and told to walk down the road singing Swing Low Sweet Chariot all night <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah I think they had the last laugh there. <laughs> <laughs> very good very good um so yeah, just to finish up, I think uh, we should probably just maybe mention the Champions Cup. I'll just mention it in passing, really. Uh, we had uh, the first round of Champions Cup matches starting yesterday, and the, there are more matches coming today. We had Bath lose closely to the Scarlets in a very exciting game. Yeah. Toulon convincingly beat Sale um, by 12 points, which is good. Wasps convincingly beat the Dragons. Leinster looking very threatening with a 35-14 win over Montpellier. Um, <laughs> La Rochelle and Edinburgh in a, in a tightly fought match up, up in Murray Field, 13-8 to La Rochelle on that one. Uh, and then we had an incredibly high-scoring game. Uh, Clermont beat Bristol 51-38 to points, which I still haven't seen the highlights for. I need to watch it. But Mal, oh, you, you said that they... You it's said that they, uh, Claremont just ran over them basically, but it doesn't look like it from the scoreline. There's a much closer. I only watched than that. the first like two thirds. Um, but it was, yeah, it was a great game and good competition. And it's good to see Bristol actually not getting some points on, not getting completely dominated, but obviously they did lose. But yeah, still good. All right. And that also, about of the Welsh regions, three out of four won over this weekend. And that is probably the first time that's happened in about six months. Yeah, so I'm quite but you that. shouldn't, the Scarlet shouldn't have won. I watched well, that game and the well, Scarlet. They should have, they should have lost. Ben Spence is an idiot. Um, <laughs> but go and watch the highlights, you'll understand. Um, <laughs> Joe, just to finish off then, I think um, it's only right to ask, who is going to win the Six Nations? Uh, France, mate. Cool. Okay. France always uh, win after a World Cup. They just do. <laughs> well, you're wrong. It's going to be England. So, and where's it going to come? Or yeah. Ireland. Um, oh, it's what, not going to be Ireland. They'll have a resurgence and they'll come straight through <laughs> for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, that about wraps it up for this episode. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, no, it's been such an interesting episode uh, getting to know a bit more in depth about World Rugby and uh, discussing some of the hot topics in the world of rugby at the moment. Uh, obviously, I'll mention again, we're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and also YouTube, if you want to see our beautiful faces. Um, and also, we have Facebook and Instagram, at Much Do About Rugby, you can find us there. Uh, so that about wraps up for this episode. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>